Hi there. You're making a cup of tea. I'm a bit late. <laughs> Good morning. So last week I talked about Virya and PT, and I'm continuing today with PT Asadi. And I'm spending quite a bit of time on them because they're so closely interconnected and they come more or less together to some degree when the meditator starts to disengage from sensory consciousness. So they're, they're very important to understand how they interact with each other. And of course, PT, which I talked about last week and I'm going to talk about again, is, is very important to anyone who wants to move beyond the first Rupa Jhana, as we've seen. So the Buddha Rupa for Friday, which is the day for Pasadena, is this one. This is a Rupa that I've never seen outside this system of um, seven day of the week Buddha Rupas. So it seems to be peculiar to this tradition. The um, quality Pasadena is often translated as tranquility. And the, the story for this image is that it corresponds to the Buddha during the seventh week after his enlightenment, reflecting on teaching. He had taken his first two lay followers following a Dhamma talk, and he was reflecting on whether or not how difficult it would be to teach the Dhamma that he'd experienced, sublimely subtle. And he was reflecting also on the fact that when people hear a Dhamma talk, and that it's a it's well-taught Dhamma, then it arouses this passivity in them. This is interesting because, as Boomerang used to say, you know, the, there's a uh, moment where you can teach or you can't teach, or whether it's the right occasion or not. He used to say something like, right persons, right place, right time. And the, um, the question of teaching is very important in connection with Pasadena the quality of um, opening up to share something, which is rather like what the posture conveys, the hands together over the heart. It kind of indicates a moment where it's going to imminently open up to a heart-to-heart -heart connection based on metta and all the other Brahma Viharas. So there's something about teaching that's now becomes very important, not just in this image, but for meditators who come to this stage in their practice. And it's interesting that we ask people to teach, um, probably in relation to how much they understand the, um, this stage in the meditation, particularly around teaching. You know, you, you know most of your teachers listening to this, or at least a lot of you are. And you know from your own experience that teaching is reciprocal. You all know the difference between a teacher who connects to your audience or the person you're teaching, as opposed to a teacher who talks in a very abstract way. And it doesn't really matter whether there's an audience or not, they might as well not be there. So this stage is something to do with teaching something to do with the connection between people, the connection between the teacher and the pupil. In other words, it's something about transmission, transmission of, of meaning, of understanding. So if you were born on a Friday, you can reflect on whether you've got a special uh, affinity with Pasadena, but that's actually quite tricky because the translation of Pasadena 
as tranquilization, I don't think conveys the real full meaning. So let's see whether, whether we get to the end of the talk and you might have a, a better idea of how it relates to you. So last time I talked about also a transition point where once a meditator has become familiar with redirecting attention inwards towards the touch of the breath, effectively towards the, towards the mind, <coughs> once Sati and Dhanavichaya are um, established to a sufficient degree, Pitaka and Vichara also become established. And this point, this transition point, corresponds to when in meditation you start to feel more content with where you are. No need to go anywhere, no need to move mentally or physically. And that seems to be the moment where things open up and these three Mojangas interact with each other in a, in a very beautiful way. And also the, the jhana factors start to open up also. So the three columns is starts on the left with basic, what we're taught originally is all about mindfulness and concentration. Those are the two qualities that Boomman taught. He didn't say much in the early years about any of these details of jhana or the bhajangas. And the second column is the list of the, of the factors of enlightenment. And the third column is the, fact, is the jhana factors. So the first stage of establishing sati and dhamma vichaya, I'm talking about from the beginning, not when they're fully developed, applying, applying attention, then adding in the quality of understanding salience meaning to know where your attention is, something about the object. The two then correspond to, in jhana terms, vitaka and vichara. And it's a gradual process. It takes time. You know, to begin with, we struggle with um, developing vitaka and vichara. We keep slipping back into thinking or comparison. But gradually, they come together and they become moments where they become stable to the point where we can touch on the first rupa jhana. Vitaka and vichara momentarily stable enough that the mind becomes still. And these are the two dominant jhana factors for the first rupa jhana, but piti and sukha are also there, but not, not yet very strong. As you get more experience and understanding how to keep your attention, not worrying so much about it pondering, it, you feel the way to stay where you are. And this goes back to the feeling of, of contentment with what is. Then the moments of touching jhana can lengthen. You get a chance of becoming more familiar with it. And you could say that there are as a kind of fleeting experience of jhana, then a middle experience, a middling experience, and until finally it becomes more understood, maybe not yet fully mastered, but enough to savor it. And at that point, the, the way starts to open up to the uh, second Rupa Jhana. So with the second Rupa Jhana, what I was talking about last time is that the contentment that develops, less pull back into sensory consciousness. It means that there's a new, you sense a new direction in our meditation. And the driver for this new direction is virya. It's a new direction out of sensory consciousness. We don't know yet exactly where it's going to go. But virya is not just a static, um, energy or vigor. If you've had any, if you remember the physics lessons you might have had about vectors, virya is a vector. It's not a fixed quality. 
it implies a kind of um, not exactly direction, that's a bit too crude. Um, something which leads you on, something that allows you to stay with something and see it through. And also because you're now freer from a lot of the poles of sensory consciousness, if you look at the brain activity, a lot of the networks that previously <coughs> keep going that sensory consciousness, in other words, your sense of I am, is no longer needed. The brain activity becomes much simpler and a lot of the energy that's previously caught up in sensory consciousness is freed. And this is related to what we feel in the body. The, the energization, the waking up, quality of waking up in the body. So at this point, PT becomes strong. And in the second group of jhanas, the three jhana factors, Vitaka, Vichara, and PT, are the main factors. But PT particularly is now strong. It isn't that Vitaka and Vichara disappear. It's more like they become maybe latent. You can compare it a bit like riding a bike. To begin with, you wobble all over the place, and then you learn to feel how to keep your balance. And it's a bit like that with Vitaka and Vichara. So in the second Rupa Jhana, where are they? They haven't, been dis they haven't disappeared entirely, but they're automatic. They're almost part now part of our body-mind experience. They've somehow been incorporated into a body-mind experience, and we, we maybe automatically just go there. If it wasn't so, every time you took your bicycle out, you'd have to relearn how to ride it. These are the um, formulas for you come across in the suttas for the developing the first and the second rupa jhana. The the first one at the top, Vivicheva Game hi Patamang Jana, Upasangpasya Viharati. Apart from sense desires, is what I'm referring to as separation from sensory consciousness. And dwells in the first jhana. It's a new dwelling. And the word used, vihara, is the same word you use for a dwelling place uh, in a temple, a dwelling place, place for monks and nuns. And the, the second one, for the second group of jhana, Vitaka Vichara and Rupasama, usually translated as with the calming of applied and sustained thought, attains and dwells again Viharati in the second Dutyangjana. So I think it's a very important point that jhana is not a black and white either or situation. As some people describe it. You know, all of you know from your own experience that it's a developmental thing, that you can't just switch it on. You have to get familiar with the qualities, the factors, not by thinking verbally about them, but actually by doing it, by just doing. The term calming of Vitaka Vichara and the term tranquilizing for PT. They're only approximations. They don't really capture the, the full feeling. So what I was just saying with Vitaka Vichara, even moving to the second group of jhana, they're still there somehow. And that's something tricky to get your mind round, because we tend to think of things very concretely in sensory consciousness. They're either here, and if they're not here, they're there. But where are they in the second group of jhana? They haven't, they haven't disappeared. They're somehow there latently. There's a quality of, there's now a quality of sati and dhamma vichaya, where we don't have to 
it works by itself, you could say. And that's what holds the balance in the following jhanas. It's not that Sati, it's not that um, Vitaka and Vichara have totally disappeared. They've been replaced by a, a new way of knowing where you are, knowing your balance, just like riding a bike. What about pity in that case? The word tranquilizing. I think the same thing applies, that tranquilizing is um, not quite right. Tranquilizing PT, you know, you could think crudely that you calm it down, that it's something that needs to be calmed down, to be kind of tamed, or um, what happens to it, actually? Because if you look closely at your own experience, it, it is not the case that it gets, um, it, it, it works quite in that way. It's more like the, the energization, all the qualities of pity, becomes incorporated somehow into the quality of samadhi. The, the samadhi becomes a mind-body samadhi rather than just in the mind. And the energy of piti, you know, which can previously be quite erratic to begin with, shaking and um, restlessness somehow in the body, becomes calmed down certainly from that. But in the being incorporated into samadhi, you're left with, again, check with your meditation, the feeling of being embodied deepens. And it's a kind of embodiment that is very interesting because the body becomes part of the stillness of John. The body becomes very still, but also becomes very solid and firm, almost immovable, you might feel. And this is a quality of jhana too. It's not a passive state of letting go into some um, um, where everything else disappears. It's a very powerful state. And you, you can recognize it in others by that same quality of a kind of embodied solidity. Very different to, for example, someone perhaps seen the Pasana. If you look at the, the, all the core traditions of Buddhist meditation, it doesn't matter whether it's Theravada or Mahayana, piti is recognized as absolutely essential. Um, that it's without it, it's not possible, it's simply not possible to fully develop the, or develop to any significant extent, the second Rupa Jhana, let alone the, the higher Jhanas. So, for example, last time I mentioned the Yoga Vichara, the, um, the oral tradition which used to exist widely across Southeast Asia. Um, I didn't give the full picture. The implication in the Yoga Vichara starts with the invoking the lineage Buddha, Dhamma, Sangha and teachers. But it then goes on to request the teacher um, teach actually initiate meditator students into the two, two kamatana, the twin kamatana, samatha and vipassana, which are then practiced alongside each other. And also, the invocation includes an invocation to experience the full range of piti, from the, the mildest um, experience, like the prickling of the hairs, right through the all the full range of PT up to being flooded by PT, to feel the body swelling with PT, floating, jumping. All, all the levels of PT are requested in the, in the invocation. <coughs> now, in practice, PT normally de de develops fairly naturally without, ourselves, without us needing to do very, very much about it. At the point of starting to detach from sensory consciousness, the energy is released, leads to, leads to developing PT. And in the, um, in the first few years of Newman's teaching, 
<coughs> excuse me, in Cambridge, a few of the students started to experience this kind of physical signs of PT, like shaking and jumping. Um, Booms was very surprised. He commented that later, a few years later, that he was very surprised to see that this could happen in Western meditators who knew nothing about the tradition around pity, and he'd never mentioned it. Uh, at that time, he didn't mention anything very much in detail. So he was very surprised, but interested enough that he got one person to practice in front of the group. Um, as far as I know, only one occasion, compared to from, I think it was from about 2006 on, um, he started to introduce that practice. You, you've seen it, many of you, of asking a meditator or even two or three meditators to demonstrate strong pity in front of the rest of the group in his retreats at Green Street. And that demonstration is slightly different to the natural arising of pity. And it's a practice where you can be taught to deliberately evoke very high energy states, almost to the point of instability, states that on the outwardly look almost like epilepsy or a seizure. And as far as I know, at this time, there aren't any other um, teachings of this in Thailand or, or anywhere else, as far as I know. Whereas in the past, in the long, long, long ago tradition, this was very common. So he taught it to one or two people in the 60s. He called it at that time the one-way practice. And he asked us at that time to carry on teaching it when he went back to Thailand in 1974. So quite a few of you learned um, from myself or Lance from about 1975 onwards. I'm going to give just a couple of examples quite, quite briefly. Because with the record, recordings of EEG during this practice, it's very difficult to, to analyze. So I only want to show the, the kind of broad features, which is enough for us as meditators. Uh, it's going to be up to other people to look at it in neuroscience, particularly for the relevance to epilepsy. So I'll show you a couple of um, examples of this. This first screen is someone who is fairly new to the PT practice. It starts off fairly quiet recording. Then the point here where the instruction is given to ask the person to arouse pity by whatever you call it, the one-way practice. Um, within seconds, you can see changes. So this is very quick, even with someone not terribly experienced. And it develops over, in this case, about 15 seconds. There's a big inhibition here. You can see from the, the, these maps, this point here at the minimum, everything is more or less the left-hand map, more or less suppressed. And then various things happen during the, during the whatever you call it, seizure or PT practice. This particular point is very interesting because the back of the head, the kind of subjective part, gets very active right across the midline to the frontal kind of object pole. But where everything else, all the other networks stay suppressed. And then you get a massive suppression where everything is pretty well dead. This is very similar to what I showed last week about Buddha. High energization and then big, big suppression and recovery, rather like the um, Buddha practice. The person actually, I think, carried on. So that's a fairly short, brief experience. Then the second time going back into this, is able to keep it going for nearly 40 seconds. And without going into details, you can see at the bottom here, spike waves that I showed last time. 
So the whole, there's a whole range of phenomena here which are very, very difficult to, to analyze because they're confused and complicated by shaping the electron wires. And you, you can see afterwards, in this case, the meditator starts to develop very strong slow waves, which we know from the, the rest of the study, developed during the second Rupa Jhana, the working towards it and beginnings of the second Rupa Jhana. So PT has allowed this person to go further into the practice. The second one is fairly similar, actually. Um, The instructions given here, and then six or seven seconds later, the activity starts. And then at this point, at about this point here, really takes off with a very sudden development across the whole head. So one of the characteristics of this practice is that once meditators get used to it, you can go into it very quickly, like that point across very wide areas of the head, which this meditator does. And they, the slow waves in the, in the middle here, between bursts, are the way some meditators most actually seem to regain their balance. The slow waves bring them back into meditation, and then they go in for another, another go at it. And then at the end, coming out very quickly. And again, this, if, you, if I showed you the record for this person later on, slow waves develop and jhana develops more strongly. And the final one is a meditator who's actually very experienced with this, who can do it to a moderate degree so that you can see more clearly what's happening. So the first, um, these three kind of precursors, if you were watching this meditator, these, the, you'll see this meditator jump briefly at these points. And then a little bit later, the seizure, or whatever we call it, develops very, very strongly. And again, at the end of it, when the person wants to come out, it's almost instantaneous. It's like he wishes, he intends to come out, no thinking, just intends to come out and the person is out. Now the details of this one are, are, are described in the paper that was published actually, because it's one of the few where it's mastered to the extent that you'll see the details more clearly. I've expanded the time scale. Where is it? Here we are, coming here. So this is right in the middle of the of the really intense, let's call it a seizure. And one of the traces, which is I think it's this one. No, it's not. This one. Yeah. This this trace is remarkable. T6 is the right hand side temporal lobe, just, just in from the right hand ear. And this is what's happening. Well, just on that one site, very localized. This site actually is a favorite site for epilepsy seizures. I'm not sure why. I don't think anyone knows exactly why. But for this meditator experiencing at this, at this time, the scale here is 500 microvolts per centimeter. So the, the peak to peak rhythm here is absolutely massive. If I turn the gain down, this one, to one millivolt per centimeter, the peak to peak is about 5,000 millivolts. 
which is completely unprecedented in neuroscience. And the person is sitting composed, maybe a bit of vibration, not uncomfortable, able to contain this energy and then to come out. So these are pretty remarkable achievements actually that someone can do that and my belief is that it's because we develop attention very very carefully in this tradition Vitaka Vichara sometimes we we don't fully understand it for five years or even more but we become so used to Vitaka and Vichara that it becomes almost automatic so these high energies are not a problem which is why at one stage we considered applying for research, not, not within the Summit of Trust, but in the NHS where I work, we considered applying for research funding to do a pilot study on whether some of the, this practice that we do in a kind of cut down form might help epilepsy sufferers to moderate the number of seizures they have. That still might happen actually at some point in the future. So, I want to talk a bit about the historical background. Why is it that Boomman was so careful not to talk about these practices in the early years? I hinted at it because of the, the Vipassana temple in London, the Thai monks practicing Vipassana, so he had to keep a low profile. But the background is actually <clears throat> very um, interesting for us to know where our tradition came from and the reason that you hear so little about pity outside our tradition is that it was pretty well along with China destroyed by reforms they call they were called reforms that started in the 1800s and then particularly re-emerged in the 50s, 1950s and 60s with Burmese Vipassana being promoted and Samatha being suppressed. And these reforms were kind of under, under the cover of modernization. Um, most of the people proposing these changes, including a new ordination line, the Damiyot, um, which is extraordinary that that happened, were aimed at a kind of more scientific approach, so-called, to meditation. And also it was encouraged by the attitude of Christian missionaries uh, who were very, very powerful in Thailand and Burma in the education system. And they thought many of these old practices were, were um, crude, superstitious, verging on with some black magic. And so you can imagine how seeing someone practice pity maybe jumping around a bit, even though a lot of it was kept within temple walls, it might become the target of those criticisms. And it's pretty sure that that was one of the reasons behind the reforms, that these old practices were increasingly seen as kind of dubious rather than esoteric and valuable. So in the 50s, this erupted in Thailand. Bhuman left, went to India, and finally disrobed. <clears throat> he never spoke openly um, about the effects of this, or what he thought, or what he felt about this background. There was only one occasion I remember, and he was following a, a big, big public event in London. Um, someone had come over from Thailand, a very important leading figure in the Thai Vipassana movement. And he was brought over specifically to give the opening address. Hundreds of people there. Something was said, I don't know the details, um, something quite contemptuous, I think, um, or dismissive to Boomer, either by that senior monk who I was introduced to. Um, and found the person incredibly arrogant. So whatever it was, it caused it put Bowman into quite a ruminative mood, which was not 
common for him at all. Normally he would just uh, brush things off and get on. But later that evening, he um, was clearly thinking about this and I asked him about, about what, what, what had happened. And he wouldn't go into details about what had happened, but he made a comment that uh, at that time in Thailand, within less than a year, the, pretty well the whole of centuries old meditation traditions were destroyed. That's all he said. He wouldn't go into details. And I, as far as I know, he never spoke about it again. He didn't like dwelling in bitterness or, or that kind of anger. So, a massive event. And you know, in recent years, Jhana has, has re resurfaced to some extent by um, teachers who developed their practices of Jhana in the mostly in the 80s and 90s. So they developed the kind of new jhana. You know what I'm, I think you know the teachings that I'm talking about. Um, these were developed during the post reform period where so much had already been lost. And it's very intriguing that within these new traditions, pity doesn't really figure. In some cases, the people practicing those traditions are very wary of PT. It doesn't seem to be understood. And what we have in the tradition where it's very much a part of what we do is, is very, very valuable. And the reason it's in our tradition is that the, the teaching that we've got came from Nagumman, completely bypassed the reforms. He left rather than engage in them. So what we have is a continuation right back to, the, to those old traditions. So that's why I wanted to mention a bit about, about this history. Partly in a way, it's part of the invocation, you know, where we come from, where we are, and the implication of where it will go. So that sounds a good, good point actually to, to do some practice at this point. Just to go in, bear in mind what we talked about, and see where it goes. So I'll sound the bell to, to start practice. And um, at the end of practice, maybe after 20 minutes, the sound the bell. And then when you come out of practice, I suggested last time, previous time, stay with the stillness. And then when you want to re-engage with the meeting, if anything comes to mind that you want to voice, um, do so, and there's no need for anyone to respond immediately. The second person, maybe a third person, maybe a fourth person, but then we might find an important theme that links everyone to some extent. It doesn't matter what you say, it will be relevant to pretty well everyone here. I was quite surprised at how palpable the stillness was actually at the, at the very end. Uh, I almost didn't recognize it within the practice, but uh, having finished, you know, I, I was quite surprised actually in a very noisy kitchen with people floating about, you know, I, so, yeah, 
yeah I had the um the feeling when I came out of the practice and just sort of sitting here that the world had changed <laughs> it changed for better or worse uh, it doesn't apply does it no <laughs> <laughs> mentioned something about um being at home i think at the start of the talk and uh you know although i am at home in the house don't necessarily feel uh, at home in yourself so i was feeling more more at home i guess um because it's also pretty noisy and it's noisy in the street the neighbors are out in the street all day <laughs> so i'm having to leave the home and find quiet places like quiet place on the golf course and um, coming back and feeling <coughs> more at home yeah finding a, a point at which uh, you feel completely safe here yeah. it's a truly safe place when everything is not particularly safe everywhere and and people are taking risks you know they're they're in close proximity with each other and I don't feel that they're behaving in a safe way. So at least you feel uh, safe within oneself. And the other thing I was thinking was, could you use the word uh, Sangha instead, uh, you know, as your focus of um, breathing in Sangha, breathing out Sangha? Yeah. I mean, where, whatever's going on for you is what's going on for you. So if a thought like that comes up, it's really using the kind of symbolic nature of words and syllables. So you could be putto, piti, meta, mudita, karuna, sankha. They, they all carry the meaning of what you know behind that. So if it helps, yeah. And once you've done it, you know, once you sound it, whatever, whatever it is, the moment you come to the end of the syllable, like Sankha or Putto or Pitu, immediately you come to the end of the last fraction of the tone of the last syllable, there's then the space. And the, the, the way invocation works is that you sound the syllable and then it appears, whatever the syllable stands for. Very nice. <laughs> well, I was I was find myself thinking about um, being satiated, being full, and the kind of the process of. Um, not thinking about it, I felt sort of feeling it. The way I was thinking, I, I, I was struck by the way you talked about PT and Pasadi, um, and sort of being the the the, the 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 PT being released and just sort of filling up the whole of the body with it mm -hmm. until there's a point through through that gesture. I find the kind of the 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 Buddha image very very helpful. The kind of the sense that that it is by opening the heart that the PT is allowed to fill up completely. It's by being completely open and yet still focused that the PT fills up and fills up and fills up to that sense of not tranquilization, but sort of integration or completion or satiation. And um, slightly weird, but I kept getting an image in my mind and I'm going to share it, although it is a slightly weird image. Um, I had a kind of repeatedly in the practice an image of an infant at the breast and the infant being totally focused on the face of the mother, like the nimitta, and being filled up by the milk, by the PT, until the whole of the body is completely full from the top hair of the baby to the last little toe with a kind of, a kind of contentment, a sort of fullness. And, so it's very strong I think. Yeah. yeah. Uh, it's interesting you say that, Charles, because uh, the uh, the feeling uh, quality 
for me in the practice. Uh, and I'm not, I'm not quite sure whether it was just a feeling or it was almost like being in a, in a space that was very rich. And when I came out of the practice, the, the sense was of richness. And uh, funny you should mention mother's milk <laughs> because somehow that's, you know, that's kind of that quality. You know. uh, so it wasn't so much fullness, it's just sort of very, very deep and rich. You know. Paul, did some woman Ruman talks about um, the different lengths of breath. And you were talking today about mind and body coming together. And I'm, and I'm wondering if you've got something to say about, I suppose, opening the mind or opening the body to the different lengths of breath as, well as, as one's working. Like, Bunman seems to have a kind of correlation between different lengths of breath and different jhanas. And there's something about moving between the different lengths of the breath. Um, which gives a kind of breadth. People have been using the words richness and, and so forth. There's something about working with the different lengths of the breath, which, which gives... Um, I suppose breadth or um, expansiveness to the practice, and it's the movement between the different lengths of the breath, which seems very valuable in this. Um, Bunman used to say that the duty of mindfulness is to be aware of the length of breath, but, I, mm. but I'm wondering what that, how that works. <coughs> um, when you're working with PT and Pasadi? I think when, when Bumman made that comment that the duty of mindfulness is to be aware of the length of the breath, he was referring to the, the stages where we're getting familiar with the feel of the different lengths of breath. And he's never been terribly rigid about how it works. And I think, again, it's one of those things where Bumman is, is very good at kind of just following his instinct and restraining himself from trying to make it too rigid. Because I think it's actually something you, 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 you learn by doing in ever more kind of subtle levels of what's going on. And if someone tried to say that rigidly you would develop the first group of jhana with the longest length of breath, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, down to maybe the shortest length corresponding to the fourth group of jhana, it could be quite confusing. But nevertheless, there's something, there's something in it because when you start the practice, the longest length is, is actually very helpful to gather together um, the sort of things we're talking about at the moment, both the awareness in the mind, but then the what's going on in the body. And the actual physical act of breathing in long and breathing out long, longest, it, it has a natural way of incorporating all the body. And the following feeling right in and right out. So there's something about what... Um, some were saying about filling the body, that the longest length to begin with is very helpful, and the longer. If you went too quickly to the shortest of the stage we're talking about with PT and getting familiar with what's going on in the body, it would actually, I think, be quite tricky to do that for, mo for most people. Um, so to begin with, there's, there's something to be said, I think, for being patient with the longer lengths during, certainly during the first and second of the jhana. But then you start to realize that once you go deeper in, um, it's an interesting kind of, kind of side issue, going anywhere 
you know, what what are we imagining? Because sensory consciousness, we immediately look for going in, going up, um, some kind of spatial component, even time. Whereas actually, when you're settling towards absorption, it becomes more, everything comes together. So it's not actually, I mean, the lengths also, the significance of the lengths becomes slightly different. So this is why it's probably best not to fix it, because Norman didn't at the beginning. So the feeling of contentment, for example, you might have been practicing the longer or longest length of breath, and you get uh, familiar with the tack of vichara, and it becomes almost automatic. You start to feel more content where you are. Everything becomes simpler. And the stillness naturally wants to become simpler and more still. So does the breath. So without focusing on the length of breath, but still aware of the breath, mindfulness is still aware of the breath. It's aware of the in-breath, aware of the out-breath, and aware of the sign, the limiter. And the natural progression is to allow it to just fill and deepen, as people were talking about. We we're talking about you we were talking about dwellings too, in a way, a new space, a new world, or a new experience. This is the, you know, in the formula, that's the the hara. Getting familiar with a new space or a new experience, and the length of breath becomes almost irrelevant because it's no longer anything you've got to control. It becomes part of the samadhi. And it may be that for one person it stays quite long, but extremely slow or extremely gentle. For another person it may um, be slightly different balance of length and timing. But whatever will happen, for sure, it'll get more and more still until finally everything comes together, finally, at one point, almost like a singularity. There's no longer any up or down or going anywhere. Everything becomes very still. The samadhi becomes very still. Nothing is left out, both in the body and the mind, beyond in the second or third jhanas. And so you then start to realize that the, the whole idea of going in or out or up to the first or second or third or fourth where it's not really up there at all it's just everything becoming more and more and more still and and, and deeply satisfying right up to the third of the genre and then finally just perfectly balanced so the length of breath eventually takes its own course <laughs> then as you get more familiar with that you can actually use it more constructively to explore, you know, what does it feel like? And you find that with the shorter lengths, it's more of a challenge to your concentration. And not to lose mindfulness. Whereas the longer has got a different feeling. And I can remember having talking with Bowman a few years ago, um, up on the roof under his Bodhi tree, which is his, which is his main vihara now, actually. He pretty well lives up there. And he just commented that, you know, getting older, this is already in his 80s, he doesn't seem to, it doesn't end the fascination with the breath. There's always more to, to understand. And it becomes almost limitless in time and space. So you, you, you remember connections that you might have done 50 years ago. Or, for example, last week, um, what comes to my mind at this moment is Francis's comment to feeling stretched. Mm. And there's something about the length of breath, but also the body and the role, all the stuff we just been, I've just been talking about, where if you've been practicing at one point the Rupa Jhanas and at another time the Arupa Jhanas, you may well come to a point in the Rupa Jhana where your instinct tells you to let go of the boundaries in time and space. I suspect that's probably what was coming up for you last week, Francis, when you made that comment. 
it's, there's, a per, there's a point where, as part of the kind of simplification and the wish for ever more subtle stillness and clarity, that there may be a point you wish to let boundaries go. And then, before you know it, you're in the, um, the Rupa Charnas. Uh, uh, yes, I wanted to ask you that. Um, I did feel very, um, it was quite peaceful at the end of the uh, meditation. But then I had this thought come into my mind, like you mentioned in the talk that um, it's, jhana is not a passive state. So I kept mm. on, it's not passive. Should I be active at something if I feel like, um, if I feel I'm close to that still point? Oh, I see. Yeah. Yeah, that's a probably good point to mention because it might have occurred to other people if, if they heard me say that in a certain way. Um, I don't mean active in the way of doing anything, probably the wrong word really, but more to do with the quality of pity and feeling, um, I mean the word for jhana There are two roots, if I remember correctly, to the Pali word jhana. One is, one is a kind of uh, meditation or thinking or considering. The other is burning up. And the implication in terms of uh, samatha meditation is burning up the any obstruction, hindrances or whatever, so that the, the, the path becomes clear. And jhana in that sense is, is very clear and powerful. That's the kind of um, quality I meant, where the you know it's not it's not needing to do anything at all, but the stillness, the quality of jhana, which is stillness that you feel at the end of your practice, terribly important to kind of really feel and savour that stillness. It's a stillness where um, what I mean by very far from passive <coughs> is if you wished. You can be active, you know. <coughs> I suppose it's partly why people practice things in historically like Tai Chi, which appears to be very, very still, where it can also, in an instant, explode into the most powerful action. So when you're sitting an experience in the beginnings of jhana or any of the jhanas, you feel no longer any pull into thinking or doing or wanting to be anywhere else. No need to be active. But part of that stillness is feeling that everything is available, actually, if you did need to. Uh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Paul. Um, hello. Um, Paul, can I ask a question? Um, when you're describing about pity and when you're showing uh, the graphs, um, you use the term Caesar. Uh, is there any particular reason to use the, the word Caesar? Or is there any kind of, because uh, when I heard Caesar, it's got a sort of slightly negative sense because it's kind of... Um, I don't know whether you had any kind of kind of uh, particular. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Do you mean seizure like us in the epileptic seizure? Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. The fact is, if you look at the recordings in a very kind of cursory way, and you don't know anything about meditation, most most neuroscientists or or people working in medicine would say that this person there's something pretty pathological going on. They will think immediately that this, this person has, has got some problem with, um, I mean, seizure means basically in terms of epilepsy that certain areas in the brain become excited. And instead of the normal balance between excitation and inhibition that's keeping our consciousness and awareness going all the time, that it gets out of balance for some reason, usually in epilepsy due to an injury or due to. Um, extreme anxiety, for example, 
So what's happening in meditation? If someone is used to seeing those examples, at first glance, they look at a med meditation record and think there must be something going on, a real problem for this person. And it, when I was working in the NHS, um, in the, not far from my department, was the epilepsy department. And so probably part of my using the term is I showed some of these records to the one of the senior people in epilepsy. And he was very intrigued once he realized it wasn't a, a fault in the equipment. And so we, we ended up talking about the differences and similarities between epilepsy and meditation. And, and that's where it comes from. Okay. Uh, in terms of meditators, the meditator, once you're familiar with it, can go in and stay there for more or less controlling the duration and then come out and with absolutely no discomfort. Um, fully conscious with, with epilepsy or anything related to epilepsy, it's related to becoming unconscious. So very, very different. Okay, that's clear. Thank you. You know, interestingly, in, um, in Buddhism, in Buddhist countries, when a man wants to ordain, part of the ordination procedure is to, is to answer various questions about suitability, including are you a man as opposed to a, a kind of spirit or whatever. One of them, though, is, is a question about illnesses and what is epilepsy. And historically, if someone had had uh, epilepsy, they could not ordain and become a monk. I think probably things are a bit easier now because of medication, but at that time, even within the Sangha, epilepsy was regarded as something which was very, very difficult to control. And yet it's so interesting that in the old traditions, PT was played with and developed almost as a way of provoking something similar and learning to be able to control it. Ah, Paul, just on that point of seizure, because I, I find it, that word uncomfortable as well. Mm. And um, I know in the yoga traditions that uh, anapani is linked to activation of sexual energy. I'm just wondering that excitation spikes and, and that. Um, maybe there's some link to that, but certainly in, in the yoga tradition, I imagine we are linked to that tradition because it's all coming from, I imagine, from a, a historically the same source, but whether in the development of Anapana, there is some facility or activation of a sexual element and then a purification of that through the process of development. So there's a purification of turning that energy into something more beautiful like love. So, but in a way you have to activate it in order to know what it is and then to purify it to reach a, so, uh, another state. So I kind of feel that the spikes that you're talking about in seizure may be similar to sexually excitation or, or sexual generation that happens to the development of anapana. So I'm, I'm so I feel very uncomfortable with the develop with the, the use of the word seizure because it... I'm not too comfortable with it myself actually. But I, there's a reality to it that it's a kind of um, situation where in one situation it can occur almost as a threat or a kind of um, dangerous um, situation, epilepsy. Um, the situation in meditation is very different. I mean, the, the, the paper I wrote on this was making exactly that point about the, all the features in the EEG which are like the, the kind of so-called seizure is actually different in very, very important regards to an epileptic seizure. Um, so is the, um, the very slow ways, because normally you only see them in coma or deep sleep. And so they're very superficial similarities. Then you look in more detail, they're very different. Then the, the spike waves that some meditators show are actually more to do with disengaging the eye at the back of the head from the core region of the brain. And they're not the same as absence epilepsy. But it's, I retain the term occasionally because of comparison. What are the differences? The differences are so important. I mean, when you ask about, when you're talking about PT, and it's like the body waking up. 
And of course it incorporates and is related to, among other things, sexual energy. Um, and of course, samatari historically is related to a knowledge, a deep knowledge of yoga. I mean, the, the kind of mind-body samadhi I'm talking about, where PT is incorporated into the samadhi, that is yoga. That is the meaning of yoga. The mind-body become integrated deeply. Nothing is left out. Nothing is left out. Any distortion of the energy becomes becomes calmed into that vertical jhana axis. There's no longer any any connection to the usual groups of action, you know, the adrenaline system, to sexuality. All that is calmed into a, a quite pure, refined um, stillness, but yet a stillness which is which is very powerful. Um, I mean the. The other comment that you mentioned about sometimes having to become familiar with, with the, including the sexual component, what you have to become familiar with is, is the whole feeling quality of the energies in the body. And it's fascinating when this works up. Absolutely fascinating. I mean, many, many people, not just men either, men and women, are capable of experiencing this very, very strongly, as, you, as you've seen sitting in front of a meditation group in Green Street, and women ask not just men, but women to practice, it's going to be very, very powerful. The real challenge is when you've had enough of that, not exactly had enough of it, but you get familiar, you can push it right to the limits. The really fascinating thing is the most subtle point at which it arises, and the most subtle point at which it can and quieting, and that's the point where it becomes part of the deeper samadhi. I found it very helpful to practice with that notion of embodiment kind of just at the, the back of my mind almost. And um, there was a moment when it seemed very clear that that pity, that sense of the body waking up, was happening, and it was almost like something becoming more alive in a way um, but it was I suppose when we talk about body it's more than the physical body on its own something's happening in the whole of the being in a way mm. Mm. Um, but very helpful just to actually see that process occurring mm. uh, seem quite clear mm. Mm. Um, and seeing that in itself seemed to aid the process of um, <laughs> keeping keeping the attention steady so that that doesn't become a moment when you become distracted, but actually a moment when you can go more deeply mm. into um, that um, that process of moving towards samadhi um, and of almost um, getting a sense of that quality of the vichara quality where you just allow something to happen by itself. It's almost like the, the body knows what it's doing. Um, you can almost leave it to it. <laughs> yeah. And then that you can link back right to the beginning, the first talk, Sati and Dhamma Vichaya. They start off very, very simply. Sati begins by just placing attention to know where you are. And then the Dhamma Vichaya is very, very simply by a kind of questioning, a curiosity and a learning to understand what, where, where we are, qualities. What you're talking about later on, further on, that becomes more and more refined so that the, the, the same qualities are holding your balance in, in, in actually very, very subtle ways. And as you realize that, you realize that what it means by in the yoga vichara talking about the twin kamatana, the, the samatha and the pasana are there working together. In fact, you don't need to discriminate them by different words. That quality of knowing and holding that point of balance requires both samatha and the pasana, mindfulness and concentration. And, and it's a lot to do with just getting familiar. The thing about the body as well, 
um, something Vijay said and also something you just said. And then last week, someone mentioned sometimes deep sadness can come up. When the body starts to wake up, anything that is held in will become freer to be experienced. It could be deep feelings from the past. It could be complications around where the energies run in the body, um, tensions, anxieties. It could be related to sexuality being over, overvalued in a certain way or inhibited. All this starts to come into the melting pot. And the interesting thing about PT, and the Tibetans are very aware of this, is that if you do allow this process to develop, and I'm not afraid of it, which means having a sangha around you, a safe place to practice, a safe Bihara to practice, and good friends to practice with. If you're not afraid of it, these things come up. And there's a great opportunity for them to find their own new balance. You know, often someone practicing the vigorous PT practice, just occasionally, might use it to like reboot the system. Um, and coming out of it can be a, a feeling of more clarity. It seems um, to me quite, what works quite well for me is to be aware of the whole of the body. So I often find it quite helpful before I start the practice to be aware of kind of top of the head, face and a whole lot as one big uh, object, I suppose. And then rather than any specific parts, but just that kind of wholeness and that when there's that kind of peace there, it's as if it fills the sort of whole body quite equally. And it seems just quite powerful to have the whole of the body quite equally kind of included. Mm. Mm. Yeah, there's a bit of a theme in what we're talking about, a new kind of dwelling place. You know, uh, uh, some of the resonances, like Charles was mentioning to the very beginnings, being in the womb originally and then coming out and having a close connection with the mother and survival through milk and all that. And it's, in the, it's intriguing that in the yoga vachara, there's a lot of um, there's a lot of symbolism to to the those you know, original um, embryo stages or early development. <coughs> In fact, one of the practices that was followed sometimes was to create a kind of retreat which replicated the womb, and someone would go back to it for um, a week or a month and allow their meditation to take them back, back, back to the beginning so that they had a, they had a chance of appreciating, or understanding more who they are, you know, who you come from, where you come from, not just now at 50, 60, 70, but there's still that connection right back to that image you had. And it's still alive. You know, the theme in it is of being safe, held, and loved, all the Brahma Viharas, and, and being nourished, like Dana, like the monk on the arms round. So the, the, you, your mind starts to become much more pliable in linking all these areas. You know, sometimes you come out of meditation, out of the stillness, and it can connect to many different things. Well, I just to add to that that I I mean I've recently been through a, a sort of a difficult a poor very poorly experience and I had a very strong sense of um well it was emptiness, but I was in a situation I was on a ventilator and I I <clears throat> the breath I just was aware of the breath, it was all I could do. And I knew it was a very nurturing thing to do. And I just had a very strong experience of that, what you were just talking about, but in relation to the stages. And I know, well, you know, sometimes it's easy to get fed up with wretched stages, this longest year longer. Oh, another stage, sort of, I really want to go to 
uh, letting the breath do its own thing. It can co- it, we go, can, it can go through that, but it can't hit at different stages of practice. But what I learned from that was that how much uh, the, just the habit of doing all those different lengths of breath gave me that sense of safety and security. And mm-hmm. that I had built this amazing building of different floors and different levels. And I've just been listening to either yourself or somebody describing our lengths of the breath or somebody, I don't know who you were, uh, as, as just that building. And I thought, that's it. That's perfect. You know, and what a wonderful gift it is where I can feel I can go into this building based around the breath. And know there is safety in it. And I don't have to have a length of breath. And, and I, I think that almost relates as well. It's based around that first column of samatha, of mindfulness and concentration. And in the end, it always comes back to mindfulness. I, my experience was that usually when we over-concentrate, it's because we've gone too much into the object. And it means we've forgotten the breath uh, or whatever it is. And, and sort of to come back to that. And just actually then being with that experience is safety in, its, in itself in a, a really wonderful, um, you yeah, know, yeah. So not to underestimate doing all the stages. That's yeah, what I'm just no, absolutely, absolutely. suggesting. <laughs> yeah. It's like a, even though we don't normally do it very often, it's the kind of um, matrix that we know very well. You know, it's always there somewhere as a template in the background. Yeah. On the PT and the Pasadi, it seems like on the in-breath, when you get PT, it's more the Wiriya end of PT. And on the out-breath, it's more the Pasadi tending end of PT. Yeah, that's absolutely right. I never thought of it in that way, but that, that is absolutely right. The way of invoking it, that high energy state, is very much like book, you know. It's like on the in-breath with the intention Mm-hmm. And yeah, yeah, a lot of determination, barrier, willpower. Perhaps. <laughs> whatever, whatever, maybe that's not a, a, an easy word to understand. Yeah. Something yeah. about, yeah, I, I think that's an interesting insight. Yeah. So um, when the arising of the beginning, the, the components of what I call the kind of seizure, mm. barrier and PT are very strong, and then often of the coming out of the different phases, there's much more slow wave activity, which is much more like uh, acidy and which are calming it down. Yeah. And as regards to the body, I mean, I find it helpful to think of like the nimitta light coming into the body and kind of flooding it on the in breath with, with some PT. And then on the out breath, rather than it just going out that way, it, it kind of seeping out through the seams and going back to the nimitta. And that kind of connects it all together quite nicely. Yeah. I mean, someone in a, someone in a kind of full-blown mode is not really able to think like that. <laughs> but, but if you're playing with the kind of subtleties of it, you can. And then certainly when you reflect back, Recollect back, you can. I mean, there's also something very interesting about the kind of seizure. I suppose I've, I've got to do this, haven't I? Seizure. The kind of seizure you have in meditation, and someone gets into the kind of what in, in epilepsy is called an ictal, I C T A L, ictal episode where there's a jump or a shaking. In the meditation version, it's always on a, nearly always on a vertical axis. Whereas in, uh, in epilepsy, it's much more chaotic. Paul, um, I just, um, it just struck me, particularly in this practice, actually, that um, the, the visceral nature, actually, that there's a kind of a balance between uh, the visceral nature of practice and um, how delicate the breath is. Um, it was like those two things trying to, and then um, when they come into balance, there's um, more calm um, and the sort of, um, 
um, and also the visceral nature of PT can be a bit uncomfortable sometimes, you know, mm. when it um, yeah. feels very strong. And I think it's particularly strong in a group. Um, Absolutely. Um, yes. Absolutely. And, um, so to just, um, and it's almost like the, the body is like reminding you or being embodied is um, mm. Mm. Uh, really important in the practice, actually. Um, yes. And, um, yeah, it just, but I don't know, it particularly came up in this practice, maybe because there's so much energy, um, how, um, tr you know, trying to work with those two things that the body mm. has to, you know, because sort of straightening the body um, yeah. is very, um, is very important. The body is like the natural intelligence of the body wants to straighten, actually. if yeah. you if you let it, it will um, straighten. But but how um, you have to be part of um, there has to be safety in that, or um, the energy um, not contained, but um, the sealer, I suppose, sealer, sealer for me, I think is yeah. part of that. Yeah. Um, very very much. Yeah. You wouldn't you wouldn't teach someone the arousing of PT in in this way in a strong way. Unless you are really sure they're ready to do it, feel safe and confident enough to do it. And if you're doing it in front of a group in a, in a retreat, like Bruin did, he was always very careful to ask those watching to extend meta to the to the person going into that mode, because that's a great protection too. Um, and there's few episodes that I've recorded which can be analysed more clearly. The last one I showed was one. When quite a lot of the people who got familiar with it, there's a quality, you may remember I mentioned the alpha rhythm early on, which is the kind of resting state rhythm, which is normally associated with some being relatively happy and relaxed when you close your eyes. And quite a number of the people who are fairly used to doing that PT practice, um, apart from all the powerful disturbances, particularly in the temporal realm, like you get an epilepsy, they invariably have uh, the slow waves, which indicate a very longer time scale ability to hold things together, you know, rather than just react. But they also have um, a degree of alpha rhythm, which you normally see in someone who's quite happy. Um, so meta towards yourself doing it too is very important. Um, because if 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 you and, and then actually all the Brahmin Vinaras, like someone was mentioning last last week, very, very helpful. Because if you're doing it on your own. You have to be careful to have, a, have that kind of balanced um, approach. Otherwise, it can become rather cold and not terribly productive. If it's done in the right way, it can be light and invigorating. And you come out, or at the end of the practice, you may go back into jhana and find that you can become even more still and peaceful. I think in your experience of the, of the PT practice, Angeline, you were probably a little bit surprised how much it was helpful to you. Sorry, how much it? <laughs> how much you found it helpful, you know, when you, when you, maybe some people are very surprised. They mm. think of it as a very, um, seeing it initially, it can be frightening to some people, and it was. Um, but I remember you telling me how you found it very helpful. Mm. It, what I find fascinating is that, you know, in the history, mm. I'm quite sure that the suppression of, of jhana and samatha came because people saw this practice and were seeing it as... Um, unclean, um, rather, um, in some cases, sexualized, in some cases, veering on using it for black magic purposes. 
And I'm quite sure that led to a kind of almost like in intellectual middle class justification for suppressing those old practices in Burma and Thailand, in fact, across all Southeast Asia. And then Bunman does this in front of meditation groups several years running, probably about at least 10 years running. And he, he did not try to justify it or explain in detail why. Basically, he wanted people to see and feel it. And some people were very disturbed by it and did not like it. In one, one or two cases, dropped out of practicing samatha, which I think it gives you a little bit of insight into what it might have been like historically that caused the problem with the so-called reforms. Fortunately, we haven't reformed ourselves to get rid of these pity practices. Mm -hmm. Is that enough for today? Okay. I will sign off and see you next week. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Paul. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye. 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 Bye.